In most cases, electron-hole pair is considered as one quasiparticle, which is called exciton. So we have a quasiparticle which consists of electron and hole, and interacting electron and hole can be described by the Hamiltonian, which is very familiar to you because the same Hamiltonian describes the interacting electron and proton inside of the hydrogen atom. The differences between these two cases are following. The first one is that here we are using the mass of the electron and the mass of the hole instead of the masses of electron and proton. And the second one is that here we have the dielectric constant of crystal that is not equal to unity anymore. Based on the known equations, we can calculate the exciton Bohr radius equal to this one. Here we will use the mu as the electron hole reduced mass calculating during this equation. And also we can calculate the exciton Rydberg energy. The reduced electron hole mass is smaller than, ele than the electron mass, and the dielectric constant epsilon is the order of 10. That's why the exciton Bohr radius is much bigger than that for the hydrogen atom, and the Rydberg energy is significantly smaller. Also, the exciton Rydberg energy is called exciton binding energy. There is a definite correlation between the energy band gap and the exciton binding energy. The bigger the band gap, the bigger the binding energy of the exciton. This you can see on the graphic. Bigger gaps inherent in materials with strong atomic bonding, which provides stronger Coulomb interaction between electron and hole, which in its turn gives rise to a small Bohr radius. An exciton can be described as an elementary excitation in the electron subsystem of the crystal that does not, does not contribute to charge transfer. In the hydrogen-like consideration of electron hole coupling, the exciton Bohr radius exceeds many times the crystal lattice constant or the size of the crystal elementary unit. For many semiconductors, this condition is met, and in this case, we are dealing with the arising on vanier mode excitons that firstly were absorbed by Gross and his co workers in 1951. But for some reasons, sometimes exciton Bohr radius is a little less than crystal lattice constant. In the, this last case, we are dealing with Frankel excitons that were predicted but by Frankel in 1931. What are the differences between these two types of excitons? Vanier mode exciton is mostly found in, orga in inorganic semiconductors and is widely spread in zero dimensional, one dimensional, and two dimensional semiconductors. Um, Vanier mode exciton cons is considered as consisting of two quasi particles, an electron and a hole which are moving around in the crystal. But talking about Frankel excitons, it is mostly situated in organic conductors, and it is considered as intraatomic and intramolecular excitation and a single quasiparticle not consisting of the electron and the hole. The life of the exciton is fully dependent on the temperature. It means that when we are going down in temperature for um, reaching, for example, liquid nitrogen boiling point, we are dealing with a exciton, a quasiparticle that consists of two quasiparticles, electron and hole. But if the temperature is rising, the exciton annihilates, thus providing two free quasiparticles, electron and hole separately. But if we are going down to the temperatures uh, that are very close to the zero Kelvin, we have 
uh, we obtain the B exciton molecules or B excitons, which consist of several excitons at the same time. When we have excitons addressed, they have featured the hydrogenic energy spectrum, which is defined by clone interaction potential between electron and the hole. The lowest state here will be defined as the difference between band gap energy and exciton binding energy, which is followed by a convergent series of levels to give final continuum at energies exceeding the band gap energy. Here, exciton exhibits translational center to mass motion as a single uncharged particle with a with the mass equal to this one. The energy dispersion has an infinite number of parabolic branches in accordance with this relation. Here we can see that it includes the hydrogen-like set of energy levels, the kinetic energy of the translational motion, and the band gap energy. On the band structure, we can see that the red curve represents the energetic dependence of the photon. As you remember, the photon momentum is very small, so this curve is almost a vertical line. Every time this red curve of the photon crosses these branches of excitons, energy and momentum conversation laws allow the photon absorption. And since the photon momentum is very small, these absorption lines occur exactly at these energies. And here you can see how the absorption exciton spectrum is look like. The reasonable theoretical consideration of exciton absorption spectra was proposed by Elliot in 1957. He formulated four principles. The principal absorption line at n equal to unity should be should have intensity compared to the atomic line intensity in this proportion. The, the intensity of exciting lines should fall with n at this dependence. The infinite number of states with a higher n gives rise to constant absorption for higher photon energies, as here. And when photon energy exceeds band gap energy noticeably, absorption coefficient rises as this dependence. But semi-classical semi exciton theory of Elliot implies that every exciting line should have a Lorentzian shape, but it doesn't provide a way to calculate the line, the line width. The latter is defined by exciton phonon interaction. Which is, while exciton dephasing from a scattering on vibrating ions in the crystal lattice, and which is roughly close to the temporal Boltzmann energy value. Emission of photons is possible from every exciton NS state as a result of exciton annihilation, which is the electron recombination with hull within an exciton. Their pronounced exciton peaks cannot be observed at room temperature uh, for most typical semiconductors because of the strong temperature-induced broadening of the lines that smears resonant peaks, and also because most excitons ionize into electrons and holes separately. The ground exciton states typically can be absorbed at 77 kelvins, which is liquid nitrogen boiling point. So you can see that gallium nitride absorption coefficient spectrum consists of two parts. The first part is continuous absorption step, which starts with the band gap energy and continues to higher energies. And second, of the narrow line, which is the absorption of the exciton, which is situated on the edge of the band gap energy. At room temperature it looks like this one, but while we're going down to the liquid nitrogen boiling point, 
this one narrow line appears to be three different intensive absorption lines. In semiconductors, the Broglie wavelength of electron and hole and uh, the exciton Bohr radius can be considerably larger than the lattice constant. It means that we can create some mesoscopic structures which are in one, two or three dimensions can be comparable to or even less than these values. But at the same time, they can be larger than the lattice constant. In these structures, elementary excite, uh, excitons will experience quantum confinement resulting in finite motion along the confinement axis and infinite motion along other directions. When we have size restriction in one dimension, we come to two-dimensional system, which is called quantum well. When we are dealing with two-dimensional confinement, we got one-dimensional structure, which is called quantum wire. And in case when motion of electrons, holes and excitons is restricted in all three directions, we are dealing with quasi one-dimensional structure, which is called quantum dot. In uh, the density of electrons and holes can be given as this equation where E is the energy and D is the dimensionability of the structure. In three-dimensional system, the density of electrons is a smooth square root function of energy, as you can see here. But at the same time, in case of two-dimensional and one-dimensional systems, a number of discrete sum bands appear due to the quantum confinement effect. The density of electrons obeys this equation within every subband. In two-dimensional structures, the quantization energies can be given by this equation, where L is the size along the confinement direction. And the zero-dimensional system have has a discrete delta function-like density, density of states. Here, the finite motion of quasi-particles in all directions occur. So it means that the finite number of atoms and elementary excitations within one quantum dot can be obtained. And exactly about quantum dots, our next lectures will be. So goodbye.